Hello there everybody and welcome back to another music video makeup Monday. I am your host here today, Miss Nikki, and today we are going to be recreating a very iconic, one of the many very iconic looks of Mr. David Bowie. Today we are going to be doing the Life on Mars music video makeup look. It should be a overall pretty fun look, pretty fun vibe to recreate, and I'm really excited to try and do it. I have a lot of good information for you guys. We are going to just start off with kind of the basics, how he grew up, all of that type of stuff, and then from there, jump into David Bowie's actual uh, song, how it performed, all of that type of stuff. We are going to skip around from around 1968 to about 1974, um, and then just go straight into the song so we'll leave that decade for a part two to this series that we'll do but for now let's go ahead and get started let's recreate this very famous look by mr david bowie himself the first step though what we're gonna do is cover our eyebrows so i'm gonna go ahead and glue them up and get rid of them real quick and then i'll be right back to continue this so I went ahead and glued my brows up. They are not fully concealed yet, but I figured we have a lot to talk about today. So I might as well just go ahead and start with the concealing process while we talk a little bit about Bowie. David Bowie was born David Robert Jones and was born on January 8th, 1947 in Brixton, London. His mother was of Irish descent and worked primarily as a waitress while his dad was foo. <coughs> while his father was from Yorkshire and worked primarily as a promotions officer for a children's charity. The family lived between Brixton and Stockwell in a town by the name of Lambeth. He went to an infant school till the age of about six and a lot of his teachers and you know people in the school kind of categorized him as a kid who was gifted and talented. So from a young age he was kind of like one of those like smart kids. As he got older he joined the school choir and in the school choir he was also told that he was excelling at playing the recorder. And then when it came to his singing in the choir, they kind of considered him as like adequate, like he was pretty good at the singing sort of thing. At the age of nine, he also started taking like a movement, dance, music, interpretation sort of class. And in that class, they also said that he was pretty good. They said that his dance movements were very visually interesting and pretty artistic. So as a youngin, you know, everybody was kind of on his side. They were like, yo, this kid, he's something else. When it came to his music and his musical abilities, it started to really kind of take a turn and just kind of, not skyrocket, but you know, people were starting to really notice his musical interests and abilities. And earliest introduction to, I guess, music as well was when he was around that same age. His dad came home with a stack of 45s um, and he started listening to them. They were specifically American 45s and he was listening to musicians like Platters, Fats Domino, Little Richard, and Elvis. And a fun fact, him and Elvis actually have the same birthday. So I did not know that. I thought that was kind of cool. I'm noticing that this foundation is definitely a little bit lighter than me. Um, it used to be a perfect match, but given that uh, it's summer, I have definitely darkened out a little bit. <laughs> As Bowie got older, he later started to claim that when he first heard Little Richard's song, Tutti Frutti, he kind of had an outer body experience and like saw God. Like that was a very big turning point musically for him, listening to that song off of that 45. More of his interest specifically to Mr. Elvis Presley came through his cousin named Christina. Christina would end up playing some of Elvis's songs, specifically Hound Dog, and she would be dancing, especially when it first came out. And Bowie loved it. He was obsessed with Hound Dog, you ain't no but a Hound Dog, crying all the time. Anyways, uh, obsessed with Hound Dog and uh, he would dance to it as well and they would describe his dancing as a kid who was like possessed by elves 
I don't know if I want to take that nicely or not, but that was kind of what they said when it came to his uh, dancing. Later that year, he also picked up the ukulele and he also picked up the, the tea chest bass. Another person who they said was pretty influential to him growing up was his, whew, his maternal stepbrother um, named Terry. Terry was 10 years older than Bowie and uh, actually had schizophrenia. He did have schizophrenia and he also would have a lot of seizures. So he didn't really stay in the house much but when he was in the house, they said that he had a lot of influence over him, especially when it comes to the music side of things. Terry introduced him to jazz specifically, as well as introduced him to Buddhism and beat poetry. And it wasn't just Terry who in the family uh, had schizophrenia. It was said that a few other family members also had schizophrenia in his family and that all of them who did have the schizophrenia did uh, kind of influence a lot of maybe his mannerisms or his like influences and his songs and his videos and things like that. Um, you know, just seeing that growing up really influenced him and the decisions that he was making. His interest in jazz did end up growing quite significantly as he was growing up and his mom decided to purchase him a saxophone to learn how to play. Bowie started to take lessons basically in the saxophone and he was enjoying it, having a good time learning, but in 1962, he kind of had a small hiccup that came and that hiccup was actually from his friend whose name was George Underwood and George got mad at David as they were fighting essentially over a girl and George pushed David and punched David straight into his eyeball punched him in his freaking left eye and that punch that he gave him actually sent him to the hospital and caused him to have um you know hospitalization stint for four full months believe it or not and that was pretty not good for david um fortunately you know his eye was semi-okay um, after numerous surgeries that they had but you know it didn't fully fully recover as you guys may know the accident gave him kind of like a iffy sort of depth perception when it came to his vision and it gave him a permanently dilated pupil that also kind of gave him a false impression of having a different color eye from what they said so he really didn't have a different color eye but it gave it the perception that he had a different color eye or at least that he was born with a different color eye and that was not the case at all. It was actually the accident that caused it. This whole ordeal actually didn't end up breaking his friendship with George Underwood, which I thought was kind of amazing. Um, they actually maintained being friends and George ended up uh, actually creating a lot of his artwork for his earlier projects. So can you imagine fighting over a girl getting punched in your freaking eye, going and being hospitalized, and still being friends with the guy. I thought that was pretty dope. That's awesome of David to, you know, be able to do that, because a lot of people are not able to do that. Let alone if you cause me damage and hospitalization, and most people would say, yeah, no. No, <laughs> you know? From here, we are going to jump a little bit into the start of his music career. His first band that he created was a band that he called the Conrads and it kind of fluctuated from like four to eight different players. Um, George Underwood, the guy who punched him in the face, was actually one of the members that was in the group. They would play some shows, weddings, things like that. Um, but Mr. Bowie actually ended up leaving the group because he felt that they did not have like the same aspirations that he did. Um, they weren't dreaming high enough, basically. And he was set on being a pop star. He was so set on being a pop star that he actually told his mother kind of back in that time frame that that was kind of the profession that he wanted. He wanted to go and become a pop star. And his mom was like, 
I'm gonna get you a job with our uh, electrician friend and you can be his apprentice basically. So there wasn't much information past that, but that was kind of the deal that I was able to kind of see between his mom and him and how she kind of felt about his early aspirations. Even though all of his teachers were kind of telling him that, yeah, you know, like, you got a gifted son, you know, it's crazy, I don't know. So I'm creating this look and it's giving me a lot more of a shiny vibe. I'm not a fan of this foundation. I was a fan of this foundation for a little bit and then slowly it's kind of not been as much, I've not been that much of a fan of, but I'm working towards it. But this particular eyeshadow base that I'm using it is NYX, which is the company that I have been using literally for years. But it's the white one as opposed to like the nude toned one. And it is giving me a bit more of a dewy finish. So if that's something that you don't mind, this is a good one. If you want it to be a little bit more on the matte side, then maybe it's worth uh, trying a different one. But it's kind of up to you and your forte. So Bowie is over the Conrads. He's like, they are not as inspired as I am. I'm moving on. And he moved on with another group called the King Bees. While he was in the band with the King Bees, he decided to email a executive entrepreneur, rich guy, and just kind of pitch to him that, hey, we want representation basically. The guy's name was John Bloom, and let me quote real quick what he messaged him. He said, do for us what Brian Epstein has done for the Beatles and make another million. Bloom did not respond to the offer, but he did end up referring him to a guy by the name of Dick James, who was actually the partner of Leslie Kahn and led to be um, basically Bowie's first manager. Under the name The King Bees, he released his very first single called Liza Jane. Um, and in the credits, it was Davy Jones and The King Bees. Um, did not do good. First record flopped. I'm dissatisfied with the bees, basically. Bowie was like, peace out, I'm out of here. I'm gonna go move on and find me a new band again. So, screw the Conrads, okay? Screw the King Bees. We're gonna keep this ship moving. Less than a month later, he moved on with a new band that was called the Manish Boys. While he was with the Manish Boys, he really started to kind of feel a sense of, I guess, self, feel a sense of inspiration being with them. And he really thought that he would be like the, uh, what is it called? Like the Mick Jagger of the group. That was kind of his envisionment of how it would probably play out. Unfortunately, we all know that we don't know who the Manish Boys were, or I don't know who the Manish Boys are, so I don't know if they did go on to become something, but that was not uh, Bowie's, uh, how do I describe it? That was not what would end up breaking him, basically. They had a, a cover of Bobby Bland's song, I Pity the Fool, and it was not any more successful than Liza Jane. So another flop. From there, Davey decided to move on yet again and go with another band, and the band was called The Lower Third. Um, they went on to release a song as well that they called You've Got a Habit of Leaving, and that one didn't do good either. And at that point, his contract with Khan, who was the guy that had signed him originally, he was just like, Khan was like, yo, I'm over this. Like, we're done. No more. No more with you. I'm sorry, but no more. So he loses his contract with Khan. No longer is he signed at this point. At that point, he stayed with the lower third. He decided to kind of stick it out, and he got a new manager being with him and the manager's name was Ralph Horton, who actually ended up being kind of the instrumental piece to him moving on to be a solo artist. Bowie again decided to move to another band called The Buzz, and with The Buzz, they released another single called Do Anything You Say, and while he was with Buzz, he actually signed with another group while still being with Buzz, 
called the Riot Squad. And while he was with this group, with that group, he had kind of like slight successes with some of his songs. And he ended up moving forward and meeting a guy by the name of Kenneth Pitt. And Kenneth ended up becoming his like official manager after that point, basically. During that time, kind of in the mid 60s, David Bowie was not going by David Bowie. He was going by Davy Jones um, or David Jones, which was his actual name. And he decided, nah, it's time to switch this up. And so that's what he did. He ended up switching his name to David Bowie. And Bowie, he got the inspiration from James Bowie, who was actually a pretty famous guy who was a pioneer and actually kind of gave the name to the Bowie knife. So yeah, he was like, yeah, we're gonna be Bowie now, basically. Good switch for him, because after that, things started to do their thing. In April of 1967, he released his first single under the name David Bowie, which was called The Laughing Gnome. And it was kind of like a speeded up, high pitched vocal sort of thing. And uh, he released his album about six weeks after he released the single. And I hate to say it, but it did not do well either. Um, so he had a lot of fails, a lot of bands that he worked with, a lot of failures. All these songs that were coming out were just like flop after flop after flop. And people were just like, dude, like, not when are you going to give it up? But it was definitely like, there was a sense of that from people um, of just like, man, dude, like, you're making all this music, just doing all these singles and not getting the right attention. That's for sure. In 1968 through about 1972 was kind of like the release of Space Oddity and The Hunky Dory. And both of those kind of started to push him into the successful category, people knowing who he was and whatnot. Since today we are working on Life on Mars, we are going to really just jump straight into that. We're going to leave those conversations for a future video when we recreate more looks from him. So let's go ahead and fast forward to Life on Mars and a little bit about the song, how it did, all of that sort of jazz. So in 1968, David Bowie wrote a lyric and the lyric was, even a fool learns to love. And he wrote the song set to the music um, from the song. I don't know how to say it, come da la whatever. Um, it was composed by a guy by the name of Claude Francis and Jacques Renaud. Um, and Bowie's version was never really released, um, but Paul Anka bought the rights to the original French song and rewrote it to my way. And the song became really famous um, by obviously Frank Sinatra. I did it my way basically um and so you know there was a lot of success with that song in that regard and so with the success of the song it did kind of make him want to create a song in form of a parody to the my way and that's exactly what he did was make a parody so since it was kind of a parody in his liner notes for the hunky dory album experience he did say that he was inspired by frankie bbc radio had talked about this song when it did come out and they said that life of life on mars was one of the strangest lyrics ever and it had a slew of surreal images that kind of gave him dolly sort of vibes um overall people seem to overall pretty much enjoy it a guy by the name of mick rock actually filmed and directed the music video um, and the backstage at Earl's Court on May 1973. The song and the music video features a very heavily makeuped uh, David Bowie, similar to the look that we just created, wearing somewhat of a blue performance outfit, uh, kind of like a suit sort of vibe. Um, orangey red hair, all of that sort of stuff. The song was released as a single and his ice blue suit was actually created by Freddie Burette and it was his fourth ever music video. The song went number three in the UK 
and stayed on the charts for a whopping 13 weeks. It re-entered the charts 30 years later at number 55, and it was also used in a British uh, TV show that was on called Life on Mars as well. The writer for the Daily Telegraph also named it one of the 100 best songs of all time. So if you haven't listened to the song, Go check it out. It does have some interesting vibes to it and I can definitely see people who were saying like, ah, it's kind of weird, it's kind of interesting. It's like, I don't know what it is, but I like it. Um, there was definitely a vibe to it that is very interesting. <laughs> and then the music video is overall pretty simple, but it still kind of leaves you with like a sense of wonder and like, hmm, okay. But overall, David Bowie is a very interesting character and there was a lot of information that I did leave out in this video. So I definitely will be coming back with a part two where we talk a little bit more about David Bowie. We talk about the Ziggy Stardust sort of era, um, just going over all of that type of stuff because he's a very interesting guy just to kind of see how he became who he became. You know, when you see stories a lot of people who have a lot of failures, you know, so many people go through that and it's just the people who break through that and just keep going, keep going, learning and changing that they change inevitably the world. So I, it was good doing this little bit of research. I wish we could go more in depth, but I only have one face to beat, you know, and I don't want to bore you guys, but we'll be back with a part two soon, probably in the next few months. So if you do want to see that, please make sure to hit that subscribe button so that you can be notified when this David Bowie part two season comes out. Um, but nonetheless, thank you guys for tuning in. Everything that I use is going to be linked down below. And if you are looking to recreate this look in its entirety, I will link a few little outfit ideas that you can go purchase if you are trying to be him for Halloween or for a vibe or for a TV show or whatever. Um, but yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed this. Thank you guys so much. And please also let me know in the comments down below who I should do next because I want to know. Thank you guys so much again and we'll see you guys in the next video. See ya!